Hello. Hello. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Don't hesitate to move to the front because the audio in this room is quite uh, like reverberating around the walls. So just come forward. There aren't so many of you. Um, I've been involved with OpenStack since nearly the beginning, and I was initially brought in to uh, handle release management. And the job description said something like, um, you should help coordinate the efforts of the various uh, contributors and set up tools and processes to make sure that we produce and release something in the end. But as OpenStack grew, and, and we, as we passed a few hurdles, the job quickly turned into uh, more, more about overcoming the values coordination and leadership challenges that we encountered during our growth. And uh, today I want to take this opportunity to um, bring you some perspective over that and look into the tools and techniques we've been using for coordination in OpenStack, the challenges we've been encountering along the way, and uh, what structure we are using for technical leadership within OpenStack, and uh, the leadership challenges that we needed to solve. But uh, first of all, I want to give you a quick perspective on what OpenStack, um, what makes OpenStack unique in that, in that respect. What, uh, what are the characteristics of, of OpenStack that make actually those challenges quite um, present? So first of all, OpenStack is very large. It's, it's uh, more than 130 code repositories. It's totaling about 2 million lines of code, depending on exactly how you count and what you include in the count. Uh, but it's large, and it's also growing very fast. We basically doubled the number of contributors over the last year. Uh, we also doubled the number of commits uh, over, over the last year. So it's, it's large, and it's growing very fast. The second aspect is that it's complex. It's, uh, today, in Juno, it's more than 11 integrated projects. And each of those projects is really more like a framework that you can deploy in various ways, with various options, backends. And the, even the interactions between those projects are quite, uh, quite complex. It's not just, you know, just a clean API. Sometimes it's more like a protocol. You have to uh, go back and forth, like between Nova and Neutron. So it's complex. And this complexity makes it painful. It's uh, painful to deploy due to all those different moving parts and all those different components. It's uh, difficult to test because you have so many of those options uh, so many of uh, options for, for deployment that you have to uh, test that the combination of them is actually working quite well. The scope of what you have to test is so important. And finally, it's painful to uh, keep up with the changes, with what's happening within the project. Uh, for example, taking a week vacation, you will end up having to catch up with whatever happened. And even in, one, in the space of one week, you will have the project making, uh, going forward, making decisions. And just keeping track of what's happening during, inside the project is actually quite, uh, quite daunting. Uh, finally, OpenStack is what we call an open innovation project. So anyone can propose a change, and that change will be judged on technical merits. And we have lots of different companies involved. We have lots of different countries and cultures involved. So we cannot really assume a common culture and, and common values. It's actually quite difficult to, um, to um, uh, as, as, a, as an ecosystem to manage. And we don't have any traditional management structure. We don't have like more than half of the developers being hired by the same company. So you can rely on the traditional management structure there to get things done. Uh, so those are all the aspects that make OpenStack uh, 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 the source of a number of coordination and leadership challenges. And uh, yet we manage to release every six months. We, man we manage to do something about this project. We manage to iterate very fast. We manage to grow. So the question is, uh, the question I want us to answer over the, 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 the rest of this presentation is how do we all work together? Uh, what are the coordination challenges that we've been encountering? Uh, how do we lead? How is the technical, um, the technical leadership structured? And what are the leadership challenges we had to overcome uh, to, to get where we are today? So first of all, the techniques and tools and tr tricks we're using for coordination. Uh, the first trick is using time-based releases. So they have a number of technical uh, benefits that I won't really uh, go, go into details for in this presentation. 
uh, for a coordination, time-based releases give us a common cadence across all those different projects and all those different groups that are actually making OpenStack. Uh, if we didn't have a common cycle, a common six-month cycle that everyone can align to, we would have all the projects would be ready at different points in times, and we could we would not be able to um, to actually have a, a, a common uh, project in the end. And within release cycles, we're also using what we call development milestones. And those are more to enforce a common breathing rhythm within the project, because if you don't rush together toward a goal, if you don't like pause at the same moments, if you don't have like the same uh, uh, sense of effort within the project, it's actually quite difficult to feel uh, like a single team or like a single project. And so the, those are a bit artificial tricks that uh, I'm using as release management. Uh, in release management, it's, the milestones are really there to. Uh, to create a common sense of effort across very various teams that are located all across the globe. Uh, the second trick we're using is freezes. So within a release cycle, we'll decide uh, uh, by a given date you are not allowed to do this anymore uh, unless you ask for an exception. Uh, so the traditional one is the feature freeze. We do like six weeks before release, we basically say, well, you should not be adding new features now. And if you want to add a new feature, you should ask for permission. Um, this lets us focus la, the, the efforts of, the, of some, uh, develop, some teams within OpenStack onto specific tasks. Uh, like core reviewers, if you just add new features all the time, they will have some of their review activity taken by uh, uh, just feature reviewing, or, or and because they will have their company asking for that feature to get in, so they will prioritize up that review in particular rather than, uh, than something else. So having the feature freeze lets us uh, kind of uh, encourage those people to uh, focus on what we actually think is relevant for uh, producing a release in the end. It also lets us catch up. So some teams like documentation or QA actually need the features, uh, uh, the incoming features flow to slow down uh, so that they would catch up and start documenting stuff. Same for uh, translations. If you keep, a, keep on changing strings below the translator's team, they will never get their work done. So having a string freeze lets us say, well, this is the point where if you spend time translating stuff, it will not be wasted. Um, but all those freezes are not like there to prevent work from getting done. It's only uh, a way to uh, 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 a trick for coordination because you will always have exceptions to the rule. If it's if the trade-off, the benefit of doing it versus the drawbacks of doing it is is in favor of doing it, then we should just do it and communicate to all the downstream stakeholders that this is happening. So if you have a string that needs to be changed because like, it doesn't say anything useful, then by all means, we should change it. But uh, we should make sure that it's worth the loss of effort from the translators, which have already translated this string, and we need to communicate to those translators that uh, the string needs to be retranslated. So this is more a communication and coordination tool than uh, some way to prevent uh, stuff from getting done. A uh, third trick is release management. Uh, release management is enforcing that rhythm and those freezes that I've been talking about. And um, we have weekly sync points with the PTLs to check uh, where they are in the, in, in the goals that they've set for, for the release. We have weekly cross-project release meeting to make sure that uh, all those priorities that are cross-project are communicate, communicated correctly across uh, cross-project boundaries. Because within a project, it's quite easy to coordinate. But as soon as you jump a uh, project boundary, you need to make sure that we'll, you will coordinate those different teams on, on a given objective. And we are using the cross-project weekly release meeting to do that. Uh, design summits are yet another tool in our tool belt to, um, to enforce coordination. We use design summits to celebrate the last release but otherwise, we also um, don't do 
only parties. We also do the design summit sessions, and those come in three, basically three different types. You have um, early ideas that need to be brainstormed with fellow developers, and you need to get early feedback on whether it's a good idea, the direction is going, uh, it's going is correct. Um, there is more advanced ideas where you, you started implementing something and you want to check that it's still uh, the way you should do it. You want to discuss details of implementation and find people to help you doing it. And finally, the most important one is to make parallel efforts converge. The last thing you want in an open innovation project is to have duplicate effort uh, from different teams working on the same thing. And um, what we do is we put all the developers that are working on similar topics in the same room and we make sure that they realize that you know, they can converge on a single project. Because once you put technical people in a room and they realize that the other team is actually quite nice guys that also know to party and have beers, uh, they realize that they can actually make good work together and the magic always happened. I mean, I've been in a number of those already and we, uh, we tricked a number of teams into, col into collaborating by putting them in a single room and every single time they just you know, made sense and, and yeah, we should do that or this or we should actually drop what we were doing and work on your project because I think it's the best. And that's really um, a key tool in our tool belt for, uh, for coordination. Uh, the last trick is our get-centric development. So that's the work of the QA and the infrastructure team, teams. Uh, the idea is that everyone's code should be reviewed uh, and everyone's code should be tested. You have, don't have like your uh, uh, maintainer that has ultimate rights on, on, on what gets in, uh, you actually have to go through code review, even if you are like the rock star or a guy that is always, always right and never writes a bug. Um, so it's reviewed, it's also tested, and that gives us a, really a common baseline for, for code acceptation. So we don't like special case rock stars and give them free pass. They have to prove that they will not break something else because it's really easy to commit something in one project that will break someone else in some other project. And our get-centric development ensures that we have all those integrated projects tested together for every single proposed change. So if you propose a change to Nova, you will actually check that it doesn't break Neutron. And that really sets a common baseline for coordination because if you kept on breaking other projects, you will probably end up nowhere quite fast. Coordination challenges. The, the first challenge is chaos. You, cannot really predict what will end up in the release, and that makes a product management type quite nervous. Um, so you have to try to predict what will be in the release in the best way and communicate it. It's part of the release management rule to extract uh, a roadmap from what's getting done, to try to predict with reasonable confidence what will be in the next release, and then communicate it to uh, the rest of uh, the world, the other project, and also the rest of the world, all the downstream consumers of OpenStack. Uh, we probably need to do a slightly better job at it. Uh, we're taking steps to try to uh, predict better. Uh, but it's all about like the PTL communicating what they think is most likely to land, and then build dashboards and, and have that communicated to the, to the outside world. Uh, the second challenge is what we call the water cooler effect. It's the idea that uh, if you meet by the water cooler, you can have a discussion with, with guys and you make decisions and, and get done with it. The, the problem is if you have like a, a group of developers that are working from the same company in the same offices, they will likely make decisions in their corner and, and with, without the input of the whole community. And to solve that, we enforce that discussions are going on the mailing list. We make sure that uh, we have a reasonable diversity in teams before we accept them in integrated projects. Uh, the idea is to prevent that water cooler effect from happening because it's very destructive in projects when you have like a, a, a core team of developers that make decisions and all the others are just like for, for the show or for bug fixing or QA or whatever. And the third challenge is tracking, um, um, tracking tasks across project boundaries. You will have complex tasks, you will have complex 
uh, uh, features that will need to be def uh, d uh, developed and tracking how those tasks uh, flow across different teams is, is quite difficult. We're using Launchpad for uh, bug tracking, and it, because it has this nice abstraction, you can have one single bug, and then you can have tasks affecting different projects. So you can use that for ensuring that all the tasks that make a bug will be addressed by all those teams. But we don't. Uh, Launchpad doesn't have that much of a good story for blueprints, which are like the features. Because you cannot have cross-project features. You cannot have tasks in a blueprint uh, that affect multiple projects and use that tool for coordination between those teams. And that's why we're working on a, a project called Storyboard, which uh, lets us apply the same abstraction that uh, Launchpad has for bugs, but also for features. Um, that lets us define a single story and then have tasks that will affect different teams and track that all this work is getting done. Um, the next challenge is different priorities. All those different groups have different priorities, and having a single dimensional uh, um, priority doesn't really work. You cannot have a bug that is critical for everyone, or high for everyone, or low for everyone. It will be critical for someone and actually low priority for someone else. So we need a way to uh, express the complexity of priorities across so those different groups in the system. And that's something we need to work on in Storyboard as well, the ability to have, to be able to express different priorities, like release priorities. This is what needs to get in the next release, what's likely to get in the next release. This is like team priority, or this is a, 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 a given group priority, or this is the list of tasks we need to finish for uh, implementing this, this feature that we need for some product. You, everyone should be able to express priorities within within the system rather than like, having those dashboards somewhere and try to, um, try to uh, uh, copy the data from the task tracker to their own task tracker. They should be able to express it in a very uh, customizable way inside the uh, storyboard. The last coordination challenge is anger. Uh, it's the, the fact that we are working in a virtual community and virtual communities, it's really easy because you don't have that much bandwidth with, with that, the person you're discussing. So you're interacting in, uh, with mailing lists or IRC, and it's really easy to get pissed off by someone else and, and have that anger slightly build and, and up to the point where you don't want to speak to that guy anymore. And we use design summits to fix this. We use design summits so that people get face to face at least twice per year, and because when you actually realize the guy that you seem to be an asshole in, in, in mailing list is actually quite a nice guy when you meet, meet, meet him in person. And it's actually quite critical for virtual communities to have those face-to-face -face meetups. I've been complaining about other projects that dropped their face-to-face -face developer meetups uh, because inevitably will result in, in anger and, have, uh, and people leave out of, of, of problems, personal problems they have with each other. And having those design summit lets us prevent that. Leadership, how do we lead? And what structure are we using for, um, for uh, technical leadership in OpenStack? So we don't have a benevolent dictator for life, mainly because there was no single person that was at the origin of the project. And uh, also the scope of OpenStack grew very fast, so there was no like single expert that would be uh, uh, master of networking, master of compute, and object storage. So there was no like natural candidate for, for the role. So we switched very early on to a representative democracy type uh, model where we actually elect uh, uh, our, our technical leadership and technical leadership positions. So the first dimension is uh, uh, program technical lead. Each of those code repositories is regrouped in a given uh, program that uh, is like uh, the, the goal. Um, so like improve object storage is, is, is one program, and you have a number of code repositories around, around that. And the contributors to those code repositories will actually have a voice to elect uh, their technical leader. The technical leader is more there to enforce uh, internal communication within the project, external communication, communicate priorities to release management. Um, it's really more like a, an interface type person, but he also has the ability to um, 
make final calls if there is no consensus in one decision. And I know some people don't really like that, would prefer that it was consensual all the way, but I actually think it's a, it's a feature uh, to be able to say that the bucket stops here and because we need to make a decision at some point. And uh, that's what we use the PTLs for. But then all the programs, all the contributors to all the programs have a voice in electing the technical committee. And the technical committee is uh, in charge of uh, a cross-project policy, make, uh, selecting new programs, selecting, uh, accepting new project in incubation, and when they're uh, mature enough, make them part of the integrity release. We also like an appeals board for, uh, for any decision that couldn't be solved at program level. Basically, PTL can solve issues within its project, but uh, once the issue becomes cross-project, that will have to be resolved by the TC. Challenges. Uh, the first challenge is uh, direction. So it's like, well, yeah, we, you have this technical committee that will result in design by committee. You will no, go nowhere, and you will never make a, a strong decision, and we need an inner stovel to make strong decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think history proved that the PTLs and the technical committee can make strong decisions, and uh, my natural answer to those who say, well, you should actually have an inner store vault somewhere, is uh, please point me to one decision we didn't make, or uh, one, one weak uh, uh, design that we, we, we pushed. Because uh, the technical committee actually, well, the PTLs and the technical committee actually made quite strong decisions and controversial ones, like uh, dropping Hyper-V back in Diablo or, or uh, dropping Docker back in Icehouse due to um, non-integration with our QA frameworks. And there was strong pressure for us to uh, actually keep it because, you know, Docker is so great. And, but if, if we set exceptions, and we just like give free pass to shiny projects and, and, and make life miserable for Microsoft, it doesn't paint a nice, uh, a nice community and it's like free pass for, uh, for shiny things. Um, the other thing is it, the technical committee is a committee, but it's actually, if you look at the members, we share a common culture. It's the same type of people that are actually get, get elected by our community. So people that have like this cross project uh, view on things. And uh, during the last cycle, uh, the technical committee always, I mean, we always were in agreement in, uh, for, for making those, the decisions we made. There was no, no like, uh, discussion around it. So we actually are opinionated, opinionated uh, but it's more due to the common culture we share between the, between the technical committee members. But that will be a, a, an ongoing complaint, I think, against OpenStack, the fact that we're actually a bit more democratic, a bit too democratic. The second challenge is boring tasks. Since we don't have this uh, carrot and stick traditional management structure, how do we get boring tasks done? How do we force people to do things? The first trick we are using is automation. So we just automate boring tasks. And sometimes it takes us maybe 10 times more effort to automate tasks rather than do the boring task in the first place. But it's also 10 times more interesting to automate the task than to do it. So um, it's a trick we're using. We're just, just to automate the heck out of everything so that there is no boring task anymore. There is just work. Uh, the second uh, trick we're using for, uh, for encouraging uh, boring task or important task to get done is uh, to value strategic contributions, try to reward uh, people that are actually working on, on those strategic contributions. Uh, so strategic contributions is like uh, fixing the bug that everyone needs to see fixed but is quite complex to fix or uh, reduce technical debt by creating common libraries or working on documentation or uh, working on vulnerability management. Those are difficult, painful tasks, and, and we need a way to encourage people to do them. And I think we did, over the last year, we convinced a number of companies of the value of, of getting those tasks done. And I'm happy to see that lots of companies are now jumping into uh, giving resources to the infrastructure team, to all the, all the teams that work on, on guaranteeing the long-term survival of the project. 
and uh, they usually see a good return on investment because those people that are working on strategic contributions end up elected in the technical committee because those are very visible across all projects. And if you look at the makeup of the technical committee today, it's more people working on QA, release management, infrastructure, uh, and that's because they proved that they were actually caring about the project and not uh, as a whole, rather than a very specific tactical uh, issue. Uh, third challenge is a command and control, the, the risk that every decision goes up to the top because we want to control everything and we are elected, so we have the power, and et cetera. Um, so we prevent that by establishing a culture of duocracy. We encourage people to try things. We just, you should not ask for permission, you should ask for forgiveness. And now, not every single decision should race to the top. It's more like an exception process. Uh, if or an appeals board, or if you see a problem with something that's getting done, then you should raise the issue, but you should never prevent someone from, from trying things. Um, the next challenge is the disconnect. Uh, the risk that you're elected and you live in that ivory tower and you lose touch with the contributor's base, you lose touch with the everyday issues because you're so busy working on something else or, or um, answering interviews or whatever. Uh, the, f the first way we prevent that from happening is to add a lot of transparency in uh, the decisions we're making. So we're, for all the decisions that go through the technical committee, we are actually reusing our code review system uh, for iterating through the proposals. So uh, we actually have all the decisions we make proposed as a change to a, a code repository that contains text files. And so everyone can see the, the stuff being discussed and uh, the approval process we go through. We also make sure that all the decisions we make are actually discussed way in advance on the mailing list, and that's on the OpenStack dev mailing list, not on some closed uh, mailing list, so that uh, everyone can voice, uh, their, can give their input on, on the, prob on the pro problem at hand, and we make sure that that, that feedback uh, feeds back into our decisions. And uh, finally, the risk is the, also the aristocracy, the, 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 the fact that you end up with a um, self-selecting group of, of aristocrats that rule the project. Um, because some projects, and I'll not name names, but uh, have, have this uh, level of, of, of badge that they get that will, they will stay forever, you know, they're now uh, uh, a member of that committee, and they will stay forever a member of that committee, and they will co-opt new members in, so there is like a strong monoculture going on there. Uh, we prevent that by re-electing our PTLs every six months with the contributors selecting them. We renew the technical committee every year so that the contributor base always has a chance to make sure that the people that are elected are representative of the contributors that uh, are actually currently contributing to the project. And that prevents this uh, self-selection issue, and that prevents us from getting completely disconnected with the contribution, contributor's base. The last challenge is invisibility. Now the, I think that's the main issue we have with our governance, is that the technical leaders of the project are mostly invisible. There are several reasons for that. Uh, let me check. There were three, yes. So first of all, we, we end up electing, we are not selecting people on, on communication skills, like you can see. <laughs> the, um, we can actually be shy and, and not really uh, uh, go out and be extrovert, so we can really be invisible. We, we are also very busy, so it's, um, it's difficult to find the time to do the, that communication uh, uh, and, and to have uh, uh, to go out and and just seek uh, attention and, and publish blog posts or uh, go for interviews, etc. It's also we don't have a single person. There is no like a single spokesperson and go-to person that is like uh, the obvious person to go to to get good quotes. Uh, and I think Linus is doing a really great job at it because he's like the infinite source of good quotes for the press, and so he's, he's good at it. But 
we don't have this single person in, in OpenStack. So you have to go uh, and look at the list. Oh, we have 13 technical community members and 20 PTLs. Well, maybe I could ask them or not. And to solve that one, I need, I need everyone's assistance because you need to engage more directly with those people because they will not have the time to engage with you naturally. So you need to seek those technical community members, those PTLs, and get answers out of them rather than expect them to communicate out of, um, because they are not selected as communicators. Well, I'm actually done. Uh, so I hope this was useful. I hope gave you a good idea of the leadership and coordination challenges we've been going through, and we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Thierry. There's a lot going on. Um, can you address the difference in your mind between the projects and the programs? I noticed that you mentioned that there's 11 integrated projects, yet the PTLs are called program technical leads. So the, the programs are just a way for us to regroup code repositories uh, 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 to, toward the common goal. It always kind of existed because uh, we always had like uh, Nova and Python Nova client as repositories for uh, 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 for Nova, and then the Nova team was responsible for both of them. It's more about recognizing that the way the code repositories are are are, um, are structured should not affect the way the teams that are actually working on them. So you gives us like a, this indirection level where we can regroup related code repositories as long as the same team is working on them into a common structure, and we call that program. And it was also a way to recognize the, the efforts of infrastructure, QA, and other groups, documentation, that were not part of the integrated release per se, but were like integral in uh, uh, getting OpenStack done in the end. So it was also a way to say, that, well, infrastructure projects are official. Uh, and because they have this official program. So they should be able to vote for the technical committee. They should be. It's really more of an organizational thing within the technical uh, structure we have than something that affects product in any way. In, in your opinion, uh, will DEF Core be an important tool for encouraging uh, cooperation between the, between the teams? I don't see the DEF Core effort as um, having a meaningful impact on the technical side, to be, to be honest. Uh, it's more a clarification of the trademark rules. What the OpenStack Foundation wants the OpenStack name to mean. And there is also confusion between core and integrated. And I could use two minutes to, to uh, explain the difference. Uh, the integrated projects are the things that the technical community is, uh, uh, is ready to produce every six months in a coordinated fashion. And that may or may not be what the board wants to, wants OpenStack to mean, right? They might want to uh, apply different trademark rules. And the core stuff is about defining trademark rules, basically. What are you uh, supposed to run to call yourself an OpenStack cloud? And that's slightly orthogonal with, with the idea of our community being able to produce things in an integrated manner. They still have to pick their core uh, capabilities within the integrated project that we produce. But uh, I mean, that's their, their realm, realm of responsibility to define what they want to do with the OpenStack trademark. And it's our responsibility as the technical contributors to this open source project to make sure that everything we can actually uh, make work together, we should, we should try to make, make it work together and released at the same time. So it's also a way to separate responsibilities between, between what the board decides and what the technical contributors decide. It used to be the same group. We used to have a single uh, governance structure that would, be, that would do what is OpenStack and, and what are we working on as a community. And with the advent of the foundation, we, we split the, the responsibility between the technical committee, which is responsible for what gets done in the community, and the board, which funds the uh, common efforts around OpenStack and is the guardian of the OpenStack trademark. Do you think uh, the, um, 
the, the PTLs and the TC are elected from, uh, from the, the developers that are the contributors of the project. Do you think that we need uh, a, a new role to take into account the, the needs of users or operators, like a, a product owner role uh, uh, in, a, in agile uh, methodology? Well, we, we actually have that. And, um, when the foundation was formed, there were three bodies, not two. And we have uh, the board of directors representing uh, more the, the, the world picture around OpenStack, all the stakeholders of OpenStack, so uh, main sponsors, uh, the business ecosystem, and the individual members. Uh, we have the technical committee, which is like if you contribute code to it, you are part of it, and you can elect, uh, elect them, and they will make decisions on what gets done. And there, were, there is the user committee, which is supposed to represent the users. And the problem is it's quite difficult to come up with you know, rules for representation within that user committee. So they're a bit struggling with transforming the committee into a, a, a way of representing the, width, the breadth of users around OpenStack. Uh, I think they're, they're doing a great job with the user survey, and they feed that back into, into OpenStack. But I agree with you. A, I would like the user committee to be really a representation of uh, the variety of users of OpenStack and have them uh, elect a number of people that represent them and have them feed their priorities back to the technical committee. Uh, but I, I understand it's more difficult to measure, you know, the, are you a user or not, than are you a contributor or not. And we solve the easy problem, and they have the difficult problem to solve. Uh, but we have the structure in place. It's just that it need, they need to iterate through, through the process of getting more representative. Anyone else? I don't have goodies to throw to the crowd. Well, if that's all. Thanks for coming.